I said in the last uh, clip that I'd be speaking about experience of God. And I will, but I'll probably have to return to this topic in the next clip too. But let's begin with experience of ultimate ground of existence. What could that mean? Well, in one sense, we're experiencing it all the time because that's all there is. But in another sense, I, I don't experience that. I, I experience people and places and things. And if the ultimate ground of existence is what's down through the molecules and atoms and quarks and whatever, can I experience atoms directly and molecules and quarks? I mean, it seems like um, impossible. Yet, you could flip that around and say, how is it possible for me not to experience the ultimate ground of existence? How is it possible for the wave not to experience the ocean? We'll return to this and talk about people who claim to have experienced God and how some of them, their descriptions agree with the concept of ultimate ground of existence. But I, I want to kind of go off on a kind of a detour in a way. Let's imagine a baby. A baby is born and they're in a field of pure isness. They, they can't distinguish objects yet, I believe, like one object from another. It's just a pure flux of sensation. And some people think that babies come from heaven, and uh, which uh, implies a pre-existent condition where they're with God and they come down to earth. But uh, I don't know how a fetus or an embryo would experience that. Maybe it's that when they're born for the first few weeks or months of their life, they're experiencing pure isness. And maybe that's their experience of God. Eventually, babies seem to learn, well, first of all, they learned that there are separate that they have a body. They learned that if they bite a toy, they only feel it in their teeth. But if they bite their thumb, they feel it in their teeth and in their thumb. So they begin to realize that there is something, there's a special object called their body, although they wouldn't know it that, the, the name. I believe babies learn eventually next uh, object persistence. The idea is that when an object goes out of sight, it still exists. And there are experiments that uh, people do that uh, can describe that uh, learning process in more detail. And then I know that there's a time, I don't remember the age, before the child learns of other minds. So the, the classic experiment is a child has told a story. James walks into a room and puts his candy in the, in the drawer. And then James leaves the room. Sally comes in, takes the candy out of the drawer and puts it under the bed. Then James come in, comes into the room. Where will he look for the chocolate or the candy? Initially, children, young children say under the bed, but eventually they realize that in James's point of view, he doesn't know that the candy or the chocolate has been moved. So they get to realize that James has a mind of his own different from their mind. Eventually, the, the child gets the idea of ego, and that's associated with the name. They realize that they're a separate person, that they're separate from mom and dad. And if they're in a good family, probably at a very early age, they think of mom and dad, not specifically in words, but they have the feeling that mom and dad know everything and can do everything. And if it's in a good family, they're loving. So they experience their parents as all-knowing, all-loving, and all-good. So, so the idea of God is kind of like introduced into their minds just by that experience. And this might explain why you can talk to a five-year-old child and teach them about God, and you don't need to define God. I mean, kind of very vaguely, but, but they get the idea. Whereas if you were to tell a five-year-old child about, um, I teach math. So suppose you were to tell a five-year-old child about the derivative or the integral in calculus. They wouldn't know what you were talking about. But they very easily understand the idea of God. And I think because of their experience, their, young, their earlier experience, when they first realized themselves as separate and they saw their parents as being godlike figures. Now, the child naturally, I think, 
devises a hierarchy. They realize that their table and their bed is inanimate. It just sits there. It's, quote, dumb matter. And the next thing in the hierarchy might be like a doll or something that seems to have personality. And then maybe next would be animals. Maybe they have a pet dog or a cat. And this is definitely a living being and it can react. It's alive. And that maybe they begin to see is, well, it's obviously higher than a desk or a chair on the hierarchy. And maybe they see it's higher than their doll. I don't know. And then there are other people who are more aware and more capable than animals. People you can talk to, aunts and uh, uncles, relatives, you can talk to, can talk to you and know your name. And then, of course, you have the parents, which are the God figures. And it would be natural to assume, especially when the child gets older and realizes that their parents, in fact, do not know everything and can't do everything. It's natural to put at the top of this hierarchy, God, the supreme person, who really is all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful. Now, putting God at the top of the hierarchy as the supreme person is directly opposite to the idea of God as ultimate ground of existence, which maybe is why the idea of God as a person is so common. But as we'll see, a lot of people who claim to have experienced God directly talk about God in terms that are very compatible with ultimate ground of existence. Now, once the child has an ego, what could be more important than yourself? I mean, it's, it's you experience the whole world through yourself, and you could easily imagine that were you to die, it would all go. It would all, it, it, you know, what could be more important than protecting yourself? And of course, evolution has put this in our, has instilled that kind of feeling in us because uh, the, the, um, the animal that doesn't, you know, has no sense of self, would have no sense of danger, would, would just get eaten. But the animal that feels acutely that it's separate and there's a lot of dangers out there and runs at the slightest provocation, tends to survive. And so we get an ego and we, we want to make it more powerful, more popular, and more, we, we, we want to increase the ego. And that's natural. And so we end up where we are, where what's called in, in the last um, clip, there was like the left eye of flesh and the right eye of spirit. We end up seeing through the left eye of flesh. We see a world of separate objects and people and places. And we don't see the ultimate ground of existence. Now, how can we do that? How can we see the ultimate? How can we have an experience of God? And there are two ways. One is called negative theology. And negative theology means becoming less involved in the show, less involved in what is being projected on the movie screen, and more involved with the light itself. This is the way of withdrawal from the world, of retiring to a cave or a cell, and of cutting involvement with the world to a minimum, and even trying to transcend the ego, so that you can experience the ultimate ground of existence. Now another way is positive theology, trying to see the divine in the world. And the last thing I'll say about this is that I think one big danger is when you talk about experiencing God, experiencing the ultimate ground of existence, it can be done in a way that's egotistic. I mean, wow, what could be more enhancing to my ego than to know God? And I think the problem is that that's ultimately self-defeating if you accept all this theology because the ego and involvement with the world is exactly what is preventing us from knowing God. And in the way of positive theology, one prescription is selfless service, service to others, forgetting yourself, caring about other people. I'd like to talk next about uh, so-called mystics, people who claim to have had direct experience of God. And I, I'll mention now that the word mystics and mysticism has two very different meanings. One is fortune teller and um, just, it, it, it uses a derogatory term. Uh, and the other, the, the, the textbook definition of mystic is someone who claims to have directly experienced God or ultimate ground of existence 
and that'll be the topic of the next clip.